Oh, guys, uh, a warm welcome. Karina, welcome back. Nice to see you again. And uh, Luis, welcome this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, great to have you here. And I'm going to start with you because we had more than enough Karina earlier on. So we'll, uh, we'll get going with you. We, we heard from Karina about starting her football career and getting that first love of it. Uh, for me, it's always interesting to find out from someone who's made it to the top in professional sport where that first love for the game came. So w when did football first catch your eye and when did you decide it was something you'd like to do for the rest of your life? Well, it's actually kind of an honor to be here because growing up in America, um, especially 19 years ago, soccer wasn't anywhere near where it's at right now. There wasn't uh, a professional league when I started. And when I was 11 years old, my best friend asked me if I wanted to try out for the soccer team. And I uh, just wanted to follow my best friend, so I went with him. And after the first day of tryouts, the coach said that I wasn't good enough and cut me. And so what happened about a week later, the goalkeeper got hurt. And that same coach called and asked if I was willing to play goalie, I could join the team. And, and I didn't think anything of it. I just wanted to be with my friends. And that's where my journey started. Um, I, I grew up, my dad is Puerto Rican. And, and when you're Puerto Rican, you're either a Mets fan or a Yankees fan. And so uh, I grew up playing baseball. And it's, it's quite an honor to be here at Yankee Stadium with you guys today because as an American kid, that was my first love. Now, to answer your question, when did my love towards soccer change? Well, I think I'm very fortunate. And the reason I say I'm fortunate is because I had a good group of friends. Those same guys that I followed to my first competitive soccer team, these were the guys that I hung out with all the time. And so in high school, instead of raising hell and all sorts of riffraff, we just went to the, to the local park and we played soccer all the time. And even on the weekends, we'd wake up early just playing. And, and that really gave me the opportunity to not only develop as a player, but my love started with just being with my friends. And that's what soccer was to me. Um, I grew up in a very small town. And in order to get good football and, and get good coaching, I had to travel an hour and a half to go to practice. But instead of doing it by myself or with my mom and dad, I had my three best friends with me. And so as you can see, there's a parallel here. Uh, as soccer continued to develop in my life, the one thing that was constant is that there was this friendship. And that friendship is what, in the end, um, is what I think of when I think of my love towards soccer. And it's a, a love that shines through very, very clearly. And it's a love that's uh, shared by Karina. We, we talked a little earlier about your, your first forays into football. But when did you start to think that actually this was something that could be a career for you? Uh, I actually have a very similar story. Um, I, started, I started later as well. I started at age 11, and it was just kind of the social thing to do. Um, I loved basketball, and my friends were playing soccer, so I went in the soccer team. And it was interesting. I tried it for my first big team, which is uh, my provincial team, which is equivalent to the state team. And I got cut, and the coach told me I wasn't good enough. And I remember being devastated and you know, being heartbroken and thinking, okay, well, I guess I'm not good enough. And in the car ride home, my, uh, my mother, you know, as moms do, sat there and was like, it's okay. And my father just was like, he turned to me and he said, what are you going to do about it? And it was a defining moment for me because the next year I did 15 minutes more every single day because I wanted to prove to this coach that I was good enough. And the next year I tried out for the team a year older. And I would play with the boys. I would do everything. It's just 15 minutes more every single day. And I made the team a year older, and then I got called into the full national team um, pretty soon after. And I, I think that was a defining moment for me, and it made me understand that, you know, it was almost like this guy was telling me I wasn't good enough and I wouldn't make it to the next level. But I think that's when it turned on something for me that's saying, you're not going to tell me I'm not good enough, and I am going to make it to the next level. And it actually gave me an extra drive. So I think that's when, you know, they say you want what you can't have. All of a sudden, someone told me I couldn't have it. It made me want it more. And perhaps two coaches looking back with a little embarrassment at uh, two stars they let slip. Uh, we've talked a lot today about where MLS is at the moment, and it's got incredibly strong. It's at such an exciting time, but it certainly hasn't always been the case. And if we go back to when you were looking at becoming a, a professional footballer, there was the draft, or there was this crazy idea of maybe an agent you didn't know so well going to Germany and on a one-way ticket and seeing if something could work. Uncertain times and a, a very different time for Major League Soccer. So in 2007, I was drafted by DC United. And at that time, that was pre-Beckham. 
So there was the excitement that Beckham was coming, but when I was drafted, that wasn't, that wasn't there yet. And so coming out of college, I went to the University of Portland. Um, my mentor is Casey Keller. He also went to the same college, and he was a very prominent figure in the U.S. national team, and he was advising me that I should give it a go and go to Germany. And so it was still a long shot. I mean, young Americans all the time, especially in college, say, yeah, I want to go abroad. I want to play in England. I want to play in Germany. And I was just another one of those kids. I was fortunate in the sense that an agent was willing to bring me over, and, and it was during that time that I – caught on with FC Kaiserslautern and signed my first professional contract. But to go back to the league, I think in 07, there was still a lot of apprehension of the future of the league. And so it wasn't necessarily the same sort of attraction that it is now in 2014. Uh, there weren't the same number of soccer-specific stadiums. There wasn't the same television deal. And there also wasn't the same sort of attendance that was at every stadium. But now you fast forward seven, eight years, and you look at the sort of interest that not only the nation's taken, but the general public. And I think that's huge for the sport because going forward, I know Major League Soccer has huge ambitions when it comes towards competing with the other larger leagues around the world. And in order to do that, they have to have uh, the general public's attention. And they're doing a good job of creating momentum, creating uh, interest. And sooner or later, that will transcend into the mainstream sport culture and so for me, it's only a matter of time. A league that's also changed is obviously the Women's League, uh, and the growth has been exponential. And also a really exciting time. You've got a World Cup on the immediate horizon. Uh, you're a star. You're in the media. Life has changed for, for the women's game. When you started, did you think that at this stage things would have moved as quickly as they have? Uh, definitely not, because as I said earlier, there were just a few people in the stands, which was just our family at the time. And for me, it was more for the love of the game. Um, that's why I played it, and it, you have this this inner joy when you play a sport. Uh, obviously, I saw it grow, and I, like I said, I had the pictures of Mia Hamm on the wall, and I thought that was kind of what that was about. But as soon as you start to engage in the sport and understand the responsibility you have as an athlete, you start to want to be pioneers for it and help it grow. And it's it's been incredible the growth, but I still think we have a far ways to go. Um, I think we need to. As females, we, we continue to want to inspire, but I think it's it's following in the footsteps of the men and understanding the capabilities of it and the sponsorships and the support. So I think we have a ways to go, but I think the biggest step is the next World Cup in Canada and home. And I mean, right now, the, the talks and the partnerships and what's coming together from that, I think that gap is going to become smaller and smaller. And I think that's what the something like the World Cup does for the sport. You speak of inspiring and wanting to inspire. Louise, a big theme today has been talking about communities. I know that you both personally and with the team do an awful lot to engage in local communities. Maybe give us an idea of some of the stuff that you're involved with and, and why that's important to both you and to the team. Well, MLS has a primary um, outreach program through autism. And so this is something that is, we just broke ground, so it's something new. But what MLS would like to do is continue to have this um, external outlook. I think it's really easy in professional sports to just worry about the team. I think it's really easy to just focus on the results. And that's so short-sighted. And the reason I say that is because when I was younger, I used to go to a lot of spring training games in baseball. My dad used to take my brother and me. And the only thing I wanted, I could care less what the score of the game was. I could care less what happened. I just wanted someone to sign my baseball. And as soon as the game was over, I would annoy my parents because I would stay there forever until the last player showered, got onto the bus, and I had an opportunity to ask him to sign my baseball. A lot of players didn't. That's just the way it is. And that has nothing per se to, to reflect who they are as people. But the one thing I noticed right away is that I didn't even care who the player was. I didn't care if it was Ken Griffey Jr. or Derek Jeter or some minor leaguer that was never going to make it. The fact that this guy stopped and took the time to grant me this wish and the amount of joy that I experienced with this simple action, it had a huge impression on me. And so I told myself and I told my parents that if I ever had the opportunity to be a professional, these are some of the small things that I would do. Now what's happened is it's translated to other opportunities, and that's something else that I like to touch on. Being a professional athlete gives you a natural 
platform. I mean, it's, it's an integration that, that you don't even have to search for. And so one thing that the New York Red Bulls has done is it's given me a, an opportunity to be in the community. And that's not something I take lightly. I think it's another opportunity to spark that same sort of joy in another kid's life. And, and we have a very close relationship with the hospitals in our area. And so I've been given the opportunity once a month to go and talk to kids that aren't feeling well, who need that little bit of a smile for one day. And I don't think that I'm going to go and change the world. I don't even think I'm going to go in there and change their life. But I remember what it felt like when I was 11 and 12 years old to just have a professional athlete stop for two seconds and sign my ball. And so in the same way, I just want to pay that forward. And I know that there's other things that we could possibly be doing, and people are critical of us all the time. But at the end of the day, even if it is for just a moment to spark happiness in someone's life, you know, I think that's a, it's a huge privilege. Thanks. A uh, very inspirational approach, and uh, one that hopefully will, uh, will catch fire. Uh, on the subject of inspiration, uh, looking back to not so long ago and some inspiration in terms of where you played, because you got to play, it was either the quarterfinal or the semifinal at a, a rather iconic stadium that I, I think still felt a bit surreal when you, uh, when you thought back about it earlier today. Yeah, we, it was at the Olympics and we got to play at Old Trafford, which is Manchester United. And um, I was sharing the story with you. You know, you as a kid, you and en you envision so many things, and for me, I envisioned probably one day getting to go and watching Manchester United play, and I would be lucky. And we stepped into the the stadium, and it was a Canada USA game, and there was a lot on the line um, when it went into the final of the Olympics, and just to have that opportunity to sit in that locker room and step out on the field and realize that wow, this is bigger than any dream I'd ever dreamed of. It's pretty incredible and pretty special, and it's just another memory that I'll take with me forever. I love the way the eyes light up as you remember it. It's obviously a, a very special memory. Where we sit at the moment, you've spent time, Luis, uh, in the Bundesliga, one of the most professional leagues in the world, one of the most admired leagues. So much excitement here at the moment with where football is. But if you look at your time in the Bundesliga, how big is that gap? Not just uh, the interest, but the professionalism, the management of it. How close is Major League Soccer getting? I think, I think the margin is, is smaller than people realize. Of course, in Germany, the primary sport is soccer, is, is, is foosball. And those clubs, they have a lot of history. They've been around for, some of them, almost 100 years. So for us to compare 19 seasons to... 70, 60, or I think the Bundesliga started in 56 or 54. So that's 60 years ago. So for us to compare 19 seasons to 60 seasons uh, is apples and oranges. Um, what Major League Soccer has done a good job of is creating and growing organic fan bases. And so you look at here at the New York Red Bulls and we have the South Ward, and that's comprised of three supporters, uh, t three different supporter clubs. And so that starts to closely mimic what they're doing in Germany. Now, obviously, you look at a club like Bayern Munich, and they don't have three. They have a 100,000 different supporters. But that's time. That's something you can't manipulate. And eventually, as long as they continue to, to approach the game that they have, I don't think there's any reason why we can't get close to that. Uh, one thing that's really cool is when I came in 2012 and playing in some of the best Bundesliga stadiums, some of the best stadiums in the world, to then have my first away game at Sporting Kansas City and really having no idea what to expect um, since I left um, seven, eight years ago and to see that stadium sold out, to see it packed, to see fans having the same sort of chance and the same sort of atmosphere that I saw in Germany, uh, that was a huge surprise to me. So, I mean, I continue to be a huge advocate for the league. I think the league's going in the right direction. Um, and as I previously stated, it's, it's really just inevitable it's a matter of time and um, they have the right people in leadership that are doing a great job what about the women's game in comparison is that is the gap between the men and the women closing uh, I, w I would say so I think soccer soccer and obviously it's the number one played sport in the world and fans of the game are going to come to watch fans of the game I think obviously I played in Portland last year and and week in, week out, we had 12, 15,000 supporters coming out and screaming. And I mean, he's from Portland, so you can attest to it. 
I think the biggest thing is for us is as a women's game and the women's team is for us to be able to go back and try to get the fans to understand that it's the same game. I mean, yes, it's women playing the sport, but we have the same passion for it. And I think when people give our sport an opportunity, they see that passion and they can feel that passion. And I mean, it's the same 90 minutes and everything. So I think for us, the gap is closing, but I mean, it's not a competition. I think what we're doing is we're playing a sport that we love. We have a passion for it. We want to share it with the kids so that Again, they can believe that they it, they are the future. They can understand that they're the ones that are going to continue this legacy. So I think the gap is, I mean, I, I don't really see it as competition. I honestly, like I go to MLS games and I enjoy them. I love them because, again, it's, it's a sport that I love. And there are players playing out their passion, which is incredible to me. And would you find the time to maybe take someone like Luis under your wing to help him develop him as a goalkeeper? Please, please, please help me. <laughs> yeah. What happens in a penalty shootout between the two of you? Who wins? Oh, who would win between us? Yeah. I'm going to defer to Karina. She seems more intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to not answer that question. All right. We'll, let, we'll get them over a few glasses of wine at dinner later tonight. <laughs> Um, I did want to ask you, just before we wrap up, with a, a quick look at the World Cup. Uh, you mentioned the, the love of baseball uh, as a kid, and you are going to get to play here at Yankee Stadium, just not quite the sport you maybe thought you would have. Uh, talk about that as a development within, within local football, uh, within local soccer, how, how much that means, this sort of development. Well, last week I was driving through Times Square, and I saw a gigantic banner of David Villa, the first signing for New York City FC. And so those two different emotions, being naturally as a New York Red Bull, there's going to be a rivalry, and I think, okay, well, you know, that's a little gaudy. But then the second thing is, it also, it also shows where soccer's, where, where soccer's going. Um, I don't think anyone could imagine 10 years ago that they would have, one, a player of his caliber coming, and then two, Times Square, one of the most iconic places in the world and they're promoting soccer, let alone a soccer team that's coming to play um, here in New York City. So there's going to be that natural rivalry, and I think it's only going to be good for the league. It's going to be good for the area, uh, the city itself. Um, and then the second thing is it's going to be really great for the league. Um, of course, they're going to bring a lot of sponsorships. They're going to bring a lot of attention. They're going to go and make headline signings, and, and this is only going to garner more and more attention. So... It's just like Karina was saying, is when it comes to, to the men and the women, we're not necessarily competing against one another. We're competing against the other sports because we do want to have full stadiums. We do want to have high TV ratings. And then in the same sense with New York City FC, sure, there are a competition, but we're also excited to see where this club is going because they're going to bring a lot of attention. And that attention is going to be good for the league in general. And sooner or later, that will overflow into each league or e each club throughout the league. Is David Villa having Luis Robles nightmares? <laughs> I don't think he knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> he but he will next year. He will next year. <laughs> All right, just to, to close up, and I'll give you a moment to think about it, Luz, because we, uh, we tapped into Korean a little earlier, but I'll ask you for slightly more detail. You said earlier you thought Spain would win the World Cup, and very objectively you based that entirely on their goalkeeper. Um, maybe a little more detail, why you think Spain might win and, and who they've got to see off in order to lift that title. Well, my favorite goalkeeper is Casillas, who sp plays for Spain um, in the game. Sorry, Luz. I, w I was just we about just met to today. say, but I'm now... I'm pretty sure tomorrow will be our favorite. <laughs> yeah. um, Neuer's, I mean, I think, obviously, we the position we play is the best position in the world, right? You would agree? Yeah. But, I have a uh, kid, and uh, I'm going to convince him not to play goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> just for his hair's sake, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how many ball goalkeepers do you see, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could do this to it. <laughs> but just based on the position, I... I for me, I, 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 like, I love to study and watch the game. And at the World Cup, I'm basing it purely on who's proven over and over to be successful. So, But I think Germany has a great chance, too. And so, yeah, that was, it was based on that. All right, two European teams in a South American World Cup. Uh, I think one of the big questions is how Brazil will handle the pressure at home. Uh, a few contenders, uh, people like Mexico, people like Belgium, who, who could well surprise. Who, who are you leaning towards, Luis? You're not going to say U.S.? You say Mexico, you're not going to say yes? You weren't selected, no chance. Oh, oh man. 
Um, well, I think the natural favorite is going to be Brazil. You know, home cooking always helps. I think the I think the U.S. is going to surprise a lot of people. Um, I know they're in a very difficult group, but they've got good leadership, they've got good players, and they have that American fighting spirit. So if they can get out of their group, who knows? You know, anything's possible. But more importantly, if they can get out of their group, it's going to be really cool to see not only this area get behind them, but to see the country get behind them. And, and I think that's important not only for the sport, but for Major League Soccer. Um, so I'm going to be boring and say that Brazil is probably um, the, the clear favorite. But to go back to, to Spain, Iker Casillas is also my favorite goalkeeper because he's short. And naturally, as a goalkeeper, the, you want a prototypical 6'3", six, 6'4", six, Manuel Neuer, Edwin van der Sar. I remember back in 2007, right before the MLS draft, I saw the scouting report on me. And the first sentence was, short. <laughs> so anyways, I think I've done all right for myself considering my, uh, my shortness. But, um, but at the end of the day, I, I really enjoy watching Iker Casillas play. All right. Well, there is some expert insight. You can now place your money on the World Cup based on these two and see how they go. Guys, thank you both. I think the, the real virtue you bring to an event like this is not simply the fact that you're both proven uh, and established uh, professional footballers, but you've both clearly got such a passion for the game and such a passion for social change. We do appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. Please, our two star goalkeepers, give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.